This is Duke University. I'm Franz Liszt, Program Consultant with the Great Plains Institute. You may have listened to the first segment of this program done by David Hoppick at the Duke Nicholas Institute looking at targets and timelines. I'm going to focus on policy pathways under the final Clean Power Plan, and then we're going to hear from Sarah Adair in the third segment, and she's going to talk about the state of the planning process. So the policy pathways piece of this is essentially the choices that states have to make in terms of their state plan approaches. And I want to focus here in this segment on how those choices may have changed from the proposal to the final and where states stand now under the final clean power plan. So key takeaways, this, we heard this in, in the segment that Dave did on targets and timelines that mass-based trading pathways appear on paper to be an easier lift in terms of the stringency uh, under, under the way that EPA converted the rates to the mass budgets for the states. But in this segment, I want to focus on a different, the easier lift being in a different sense, and that is that in terms of the steps and the to-do list that states have in order to implement a mass-based trading pathway, it, it does appear pretty clear under the final rule that mass-based trading pathways are going to be easier to implement. And this isn't a huge surprise, it's just that we have a better sense under the final than we did under the proposal. Another key difference is that EPA embraced the trading-ready common elements approaches uh, uh, in the final model rule, in the final rule and the final model rules that accompany it. And, and so this was a trend leading up to the final rule that states and stakeholders in, in various regions were asking that EPA make it easier to trade with, with each other. And they do that in for both rate and for mass. So what we have now under the final is a new rate-based trading ready option. And um, talk a little bit more about that in this presentation. Another new aspect, and Dave touched a, a little bit on this, is that new units are excluded from a rate-based approach, and, and EPA is encouraging them to be included on the mass-based side, and they do that both through the requirement to address leakage under a mass-based program and also by providing a new source complement, so some additional allowance, allowances, some additional allowed tons in the mass-based budget if the state covers the new unit. And then lastly, I want to talk about one key thing. Um, now that we have two trading-ready approaches, rate versus mass, um, rate and mass, we also have a better sense for how EPA is expecting the rate-based approach to work. So I'm going to talk a little bit about how EPA lays out the requirements for the emission reduction credit, which are the new name for rate-based credit. So under the proposal, states had so many choices. Um, in fact, I heard one with utility regulatory commissioner, I won't name her, say in a public forum that there were too many choices. There are just lots to choose from. And states were starting with a blank piece of paper and, and had a lot of choices to make to, to finally uh, to get moving on putting pen to that piece of paper. Under the final, I think we can say that states still have quite a few choices. Um, and so it's still necessary to, to walk through a decision-making framework such as that outlined here on the slide. States' objectives and goals have not changed from proposed to final, things like doing this in the most cost-effective manner or achieving the goal or um, keeping the lights on, maintaining reliability. All of those objectives and goals are the same. So what about the threshold question? And under the proposal, we thought of those as rate versus mass, who to regulate, think decisions on trading, and what to do with new units. And I'm going to walk through these, but we can generally say that things have gotten easier. Uh, choices are clearer in many of these instances. And once I, once I walk through those threshold questions, I'm going to 
focus on the policy pathway options as EPA has laid them out. Each of these threshold questions is different. In some cases, the decisions are made much clearer. In other cases, like rate versus mass, uh, there are some additional considerations to make under the final, uh, but still represent a key threshold decision that states are just going to have to make after hearing from their stakeholders. So I'm going to go through rate versus mass, talk about trading, who to regulate, uh, how EPA has addressed this interstate trading ready concept, and then focus on new units and how, how each of these questions has, is different under the final. I don't want to imply that everything's changed. Um, the comparisons that were done under the proposal between mass and rate, much of those comparisons still holds true. The pros and cons of each approach hold true. But we do know that a, a number of things have changed, and I think some of these things will be determinative for some, some folks who have, were, were making the comparison in the past. So on the rate-based side, we have a new rate-based trading ready option, and that's embodied in one of the two proposed model rules that EPA put out simultaneously with the final rule. This is important because a lot of folks that were ruling Matt, leaning against rate in, under the proposal were doing so because they felt there was just no easy way to have trading among states. There were certainly a lot of questions around whether trading ready was an option on the rate-based side. EPA has answered that. They've provided an option using the two subcategory-specific rates. As long as the state takes that approach, they are deemed trading ready. So that probably changes things in the comparison for a number of folks. We also have a much better idea what the requirements are for issuing emission reduction credits, those rate-based credits that are are important on a rate-based trading approach. And um, I'm going to talk a little bit more about that. But there were widely different views among stakeholders and policy thinkers about what would be required. And EPA made it pretty clear. They've laid out the process. We now also know that new NGCC plants cannot earn credit under a rate-based approach. So anyone who was thinking that the way to achieve the rate-based goal was to bring in lots of new NGCC plants well, that's not an option anymore. So the, achieving the rate-based goal is going to have to depend on, on other ways to get and generate credits. And I just want to note that the single rate approach that we analyzed under the proposal, that's still available. Um, and so it's an option that it's not, not the subject of the model rule, but it's, it's there if a state wishes to take that approach. On the mass-based side, we now have the budget. So remember under the proposal, there was a lot of consternation around the rate to mass conversion. Well, in the final EPA has said, there is no rate to mass conversion for you to make. We've done it for you. Here are your budgets. And here are these new source complements, which represent additional bits of budget. If you, if you cover new sources in your state, you get some extra tons in your budget. And they call that the new source complement. So those are there. And as David Hoppick pointed out in his presentation, they're more generous. Uh, under than they were under the proposal. And so that probably will change the way folks think about this rate versus mass comparison. Mass-based states have a new requirement. Dave touched on this as well. They have to either cover those new NGCC plants or they have to use an allocation method or other means to counteract the leakage that would occur. Uh, in other words, the incentive that would, would exist to build new plants because they're not covered by the program the state must must overcome that, stop, then they have to do something to uh, disincentivize that shift or cover new units. So that's a new thing. It's a new hoop that a state would have to jump through if they take a mass-based approach. EPA in the, in the final rule analysis says that it costs much less to take a mass-based approach and nearly 40% less. Uh, now, it's important to say that they modeled the single rate approach, single merge rates across states versus the mass-based approach. They did not model the, the subcategory trading approach that's in the model rule. So we need to test this to see if, it's, if the same relationship and cost exists under the comparing the two model rule approaches. But it's, a, it's something to note. It appears that They've, they have put the thumb on the scale in favor of mass in terms of the, the stringency, as they've uh, pointed out 
is, is true by looking at the percentage comparison and reduction. And then I think we can say, now that we see the rules all laid out, that the process and the rules and the infrastructure needs are less burdensome on the mass based side than rate. And so states will have a very clear comparison to make. They'll know what they have to do under rate, they'll know what they have to do under mass, and it's, it's pretty clear now that uh, mass is going to be easier. So the rate to mass comparison has changed, and that may, may end up changing the way stakeholders and states think about the, the two options and may help them make that decision. But the decision isn't made for them. Uh, it's still very much a decision under the final rule. In contrast, the question of who to regulate is much simpler than it was under the proposal. Under the proposal, we had notions of having federally enforceable obligation on entities other than owners and operators of covered power plants. That's gone. There will only be, under the final rule, federally enforceable requirements on, the, on owners and operators of power plants. And what EPA says is you essentially have two options. And they have, you have two options if you take a mass-based approach. If you take a mass-based approach, you can either have emission standards that are like a traditional program that cover owners and operators of power plants, or you can take a state measures approach. State measures approach is probably not going to be all that appealing to most states. I say that because it essentially requires the state to develop two programs. In the first instance, the state has to have a set of state enforceable measures that get them to the state mass-based goal. Um, and then if for any reason those state enforceable measures don't get them there, then a federally enforceable backstop must be waiting in the wings that kicks in if the state measures don't perform. And so it's having to think about two programs, one that's the set of state measures and another that's federally enforceable, it might be enough to discourage most states and, and point them to the emission standard side. The state measures approach was largely developed, it appears, to accommodate California's situation and the Reggie situation, where they have programs already covering power plant emissions, carbon dioxide emissions. Um, it doesn't seem well tailored to most other states. I could could turn out to be wrong there, but that's my gut sense. So the who to regulate stuff is really boiled down to two options for mass-based plans. And then important to note, if you go rate-based, you have only one option, and that's emission standards. So the state measures approach is only available to mass-based uh, plans. Much easier than it was under the proposal, lots, lots fewer choices. Trading and interstate trading are, is also an area where EPA is uh, taking some jumps ahead in response to what they heard from stakeholders and states asking for the option to, to allow trading to lower cost and safeguard reliability. So to make trading easier, EPA has proposed two model rules, one on the rate-based side, one on the mass-based side. And if a state adopts those model rules, so then their, their plans are presumptively approvable. So that's a big leg up for a state. Uh, and one that many states you know, will find attractive, at least worth analyzing, the two model rules. Those model rules were proposed in August. Uh, there'll be a 90-day comment period on the model rules that will be triggered by the publishing of that in the Federal Register. But um, Sarah will talk a little bit more about the plan development process in a minute. And then on interstate trading, as I mentioned in the overview, trading ready has really been fully embraced by EPA in the final. So states can pursue a trading-ready plan, and the nice thing about the option is they don't need to decide early on whether, whether they're going to trade with other states or, 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 or with whom. They can switch that on when they're ready, and it's, it's sort of an option they can keep open through the plan development process and, and hear from stakeholders and review analyses and figure out what's best. So on the trading front, EPA has made it easier to allow trading, and they've, they've enabled this keep the option open for interstate trading through a trading-ready concept. So the good news for states in terms of those that wanted the, those options. And then lastly, on the threshold questions, how to handle new units. It was a big topic, as Dave mentioned, in the analyses under the proposal. It turned out including new units are not really made a big, big difference in terms of impacts of the, of the program. Um, EPA has made some of the choices for us here. So if a state takes a rate-based standard, a rate-based approach, then they cannot cover new units. So the new units won't help a state meet a rate-based standard. 
that's a big change from the proposal. A state that takes rate-based approach doesn't have to even think about new units. It's off the table. On the mass-based side, the decision is, is framed a bit differently than it was under the proposal. You have, if you cover just existing units, you must come up with another way to address potential leakage to new units that would have an incentive to operate in competition with those existing units that would have the obligation under the state 111B plan. And so a state could either come up with a way to address the leakage or they can just cover the, the new sources. And there are complements that are added to the state's budget to, to um, allow that to happen. And as Dave pointed out, the budgets themselves include quite a, quite a margin for growth, which is one reason we, we've heard so many people describe them as more generous this time. So the new units question on the rate-based side is settled. On the mass-based side, it's framed, it's framed around including them and getting the new source complement. And on the one hand, or don't include them, but come up with a way to, to keep them from encouraging leakage to new plants. Much, much simpler um, than under the, under the proposal. We still have the rate versus mass. That's probably the single, remains the single biggest threshold question states will have to make. The regulate whom question, very much simpler, and trading and interstate trading ready uh, enabled for states uh, under the proposed model rules that EPA has put out. So where does that put us in terms of the policy pathway options? So this is a very busy slide. It's a graphic that comes from you directly from EPA in the presentation that they released at the time of the final rule was released. and um, we debated whether to use this in the presentation, decided in favor of doing it because the graphic speaks volumes about what EPA is, is, thinks about the relative difficulty or the relative complexity of the different approaches. Um, in a graphic sense, even without reading the stuff, you can sort of blur your eyes and see that the top lines are simpler than the lower lines, um, and that's, that's important to note. And this graphic is actually found on a slide in EPA's presentation that's surrounded by text that explains why mass-based options are cheaper. And so the message, I think, is that mass-based problem, mass-based approaches are going to be easier and they're going to be cheaper. That's the message EPA wanted to send. And they're doing that in graphic form here. Another thing I would just point out in a graphic sense, the, the white boxes are like hoops that a state has to jump through. Um, so without even reading the text within them, if you, if you look at them and you say, all right, this line has four boxes, another line at the top has no boxes, well, the one with four boxes is, has, has more hoops to jump through to, to implement. Um, so graphically, EPA is telling us a lot, even before we start reading the lines. The next thing we can see here in the, comparing the options is they've provided two model rules. Um, and they've done that for mass-based trading ready, and that's the middle line at the top, the middle line among the mass-based options, and they've provided a model rule at, on the top of the rate-based options that uses the subcategorized emission performance rates that, that Dave described in his, in his segment. So what we have are two model rules, which as the, any air regulator knows, when there's a model rule that basically everything's all laid out there for you, you can tweak it, but it's a lot easier than coming up with a program from scratch. So EPA is, in a sense, putting their thumb on the scale for those two options with model rules. They're saying, if you do rate, here's a model rule, we'll make it easy for you to do it this way. If you do math, here's a model rule, we'll make it easy for you to do it that way. State measures approach, which, we, which I mentioned above, is the bottom mass approach up there. It can be made trading ready. Um, there are some, some hitches if there's some Springs attached to making a trading ready, which we could, we'd be happy to get into with you in a, in a more specific conversation. But suffice it to say that most states probably won't want to won't take that approach because they need to have both a set of state measures and a federal backstop. And then the two bottom rate-based approaches, they are mostly geared toward intrastate trading. Interstate trading is tough. The one in the middle down at the bottom would require Interstate with multi-state plan, that requires negotiating with other states. It's not trading ready. And then the bottom one is doesn't even really comp contemplate interstate trading. 
And so we can probably say that for most states, looking at EPA's map, they're going to be focused on these options, um, the mass-based trading ready option and the rate-based trading ready option. The reason I have both of these mass-based options on this slide is we know that when we look at the model rule for the EPA mass goal for existing units only, we, we can see that it could be easily tweaked to include new units. We know EPA doesn't do that because they, they um, have assessed their legal authority to not include being able to cover new units. So their model rule is what they would use under the federal plan, and so that it doesn't cover new units. But a state that wants to cover new units uh, and to avoid having to address potential leakage, to have that one fewer hoop to jump through, they could use the model rule fairly, fairly easily. Um, but I think on a whole, it appears EPA expects states to take one of these three approaches. And they're, they have the sum on the scale for mass-based options, at least in the sense that they've made it easier, fewer hoops to jump through, and also they've, they've, uh, their analysis is tending to show that it's quite a bit less costly, something we have to test. All right, so how do you make, how do you make a choice between these mass-based trading ready and rate-based trading ready? Um, there may end up being proponents for each approach. And in evaluating the two options, we need to understand what's involved in the rate-based crediting piece. Mass-based side, we've seen quite a bit um, in, for other air pollutants. Um, rate-based is the relatively new creature. So one of the things I wanted to just highlight in this relatively short segment is the way that EPA has mapped out the emission reduction credit process. It'll happen in two steps. And those of you who are familiar with offset components and other uh, programs, such as California's and Reggie's, this is pretty similar to those approaches. Step one would be an eligibility application. So if I'm an energy efficiency project developer and a renewable energy project developer, I go in with my eligibility application and I say, my project meets your rules for ERC, ERC qualification, and here's a third-party verification that attests to that fact. And then you have the guy at the agency or the woman at the agency, or maybe there's several of these behind the imaginary ERC desk, and that person takes the application, determines whether it's eligible. And assuming it is eligible, the project proponent goes off and does the project, once the project starts uh, realizing emission reductions or shows savings, um, then the credit application can be submitted. Uh, there's a timeline for that. It, this is a simplified graphic. The step two is to go back to the Earth desk and with your third-party verification say, we have realized the generation or we have realized the energy savings that justify your issuing us some ERCs. Then the ERCs come out. Now, EPA has talked about having a separate application registry, so there would be a tracking system for when an application for eligibility comes in. That way, folks on the outside could see which projects are already the subject of ERC applications. And hopefully, uh, I think the notion is states would then find it easier to prevent double counting of the same project um, in two different states or even within the same state. And then I would just note liability for the improperly issued emission reduction credit lies with the affected EGU who uses them for compliance. This is kind of a buyer beware uh, concept that EPA has adopted, probably because it's the most easily enforced required way to enforce ERCs. Um, you know they're when they're used, if they're bad, then that's the person who uses them who's on the hook for any, any bad ERC. So reflecting on that and reflecting on what the infrastructure and staffing needs would be, this is probably the key consideration about whether you would take a mass-based trading approach or a rate-based trading approach. Um, and here is, are some of the things you have to do. I just showed you the credit desk and the way that applications get processed. EPA says you need a third-party verifier accreditation process and rules for things like conflict of interest and um, you know, if a third-party verifier turns out to be bad or not doing his or her job well, ways to, uh, to re revoke their accreditation. Um, they talk about the ERP application tracking system I mentioned. It seems like they may be providing that for states if they're asked, or if EPA ends up imposing a federal plan that is based on this approach. Um, 
EPA refers to an administrative process for challenging ERCs. It's not clear from the text whether it's optional for states, whether states have to have this administrative process or whether, but EPA is clearly intending to use the Part 78 process that's already on the federal books in the event they, they administer a rate-based program in a federal plan. Uh, but the notion of the administrative process is that there would be a place to go to challenge ERCs before having to go to court. Uh, and hopefully that would lead to fewer court cases involving ERC, ERC disputes. There are also skilled certification requirements that EPA is suggesting states must have. And that, you know, would be things that would license workers in these fields, energy efficiency, renewables, to make sure that things are, are being carried out in a knowledgeable way. And then I mentioned enforcement lies at the state where the ERC is used, so that would have to be thought out by the state. The reason I'm mentioning these things is that when a state is considering rate versus mass, understanding what they need to build and the kind of staff they need to hire and um, uh, essentially the administrative challenge that they're taking on with rate is going to be part of that. They're going to do that if they think it's worth it. Um, so I'm going to stop there, and we're, we're going to we're going to then stop for a second. Sarah is going to record the third segment. I encourage you to, if you haven't already, check out David Hoppick's segment on the target setting piece. And um, if you haven't already, check out Sarah's segment on the plan development process. Thanks for listening.